Let's bring in Tara Palmieri and Sabrina Siddiqui in our Washington bureau. Tara is White House correspondent for Politico, and Sabrina Siddiqui is political reporter for The Guardian. Ladies, welcome once again. So much to get to. All right, <laughs> let's start with this. Uh, the outstanding question, according to Sean Spicer, isn't what the lawmakers say about the wiretap claims, but what the Justice Department says. So what are the stakes for FBI Director James Comey's testimony to the House Intelligence Committee on Monday? Let me start with you, Sabrina. Well, I think that you could expect James Comey to face aggressive questioning over what exactly it is that the Department of Justice might know, because what we're aware of is through reporting that when the allegation was first made by Donald Trump about wiretapping, James Comey had wanted the D Department of Justice to publicly rebuke uh, that allegation because there simply has not been any evidence to substantiate it. Now you have the White House insinuating that actually we might know more information than the two committees, intelligence committees in Congress, who so far, based on their own review, are saying that no such wiretapping occurred. So I think you're really going to see Comey under a lot of pressure, that even if that information is being deemed classified as of now, in the name, of, in the, for the good of the public, it should be revealed so that this issue is put to rest. Tara, what do you think? I think that it's going to make for some very interesting television, to say the least, mm -hmm. during this uh, testimony, because you have to remember that he is going to be walking a tightrope. You know, anything he says to discredit the president is going to put him in a, in a bad relationship with the executive branch. And yet you're going to have um, very powerful key Democrats in the House trying to get him to essentially say that the president's uh, word is not credible and that he was lying and he fired off these tweets. So he is going to be really, it's going to be a juggling performance and he'll be, you know, tap dancing around a lot of these questions. But at the end of the day, you know, he's in a, he's in a tough spot and people want answers. Yeah, we'll all be watching that closely. All right, let's talk about the president's budget. It boosts defense spending, leaves Social Security mm -hmm. untouched while making deep cuts to domestic programs. Now, Mr. Trump's base, as you both know, consists in part of low-income workers who rely on the very programs on the chopping block. Sabrina, does the White House, you think, see those cuts as risky? Well, the White House actually was unapologetic about the priorities it's laid out in this budget blueprint. We heard from the budget director, Mick Mulvaney, today, and he essentially said that a lot of these domestic programs are not functioning in the way that they should be and really didn't express any concern about gutting housing programs, food, assistant pro food assistance programs, educational programs that provide after-school services, among other things. It's also striking, though, that, as you say, people who supported Donald Trump are the ones who stand to lose. Okay. This budget blueprint also cuts, for example, uh, water and waste spending in rural areas, as well as funding for airports in rural areas. But again, you have to remember that budget blueprints at the end of the day are a statement of administration's priorities. Congress is the one that will have to approve, negotiate and approve a budget. And Republicans themselves on Capitol Hill are saying that this one from the White House is a non-starter. Yeah. What do you think, Tara? I would agree. I mean, you're already hearing Republicans on the Hill saying, guess what? We have constituents and they can't be hungry, mm -hmm. um, especially from a lot of states like like uh, that, that actually did vote for Trump. But they have their own special interests. They have their own earmarks and entitlements and they want to get reelected. I mean, they might the president, you know, Mulvaney said that the president doesn't deal with their special interests or their lobbyists. But I mean, it just seems like a politically tough stance to take to go after Meals on Wheels and after school programs for children. I mean, it's just, you just, I, I would think that you would want to stay very far away from this. And it doesn't seem like it's that much money that they're saving. Yeah. And even a lot of the, um, like Marco Rubio said that he doesn't necessarily agree with the nearly 30% cut to the budget of the State Department. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of Republicans do believe in soft power. They're not just war hawks. And they see the value in diplomacy in terms of dealing with ISIS and a lot of the other threats. So, you know, if this isn't like a down the line Republican line and you're, you're seeing dissension already and I think it's going to grow louder and louder, especially when you start talking to people on the ground who are actually losing the federal um, support that they've been receiving and maybe didn't even realize it. Well, Tara, let me ask you, on the president's blocked travel ban, the judges who opposed the measure cited Mr. Trump's past public comments mm -hmm. to suggest that national security might not be its main motivator. How big a problem is it for the White House if those comments are accepted in a lawsuit? I mean, it, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, it, it is 
the federal government is arguing that you can't go back and use prior comments to attribute to this um, to this actual uh, executive order, but. It seems that he targeted countries from Muslim nations that, that are made of, of predominantly Muslim people, so it, it would go in line with a prior promise that he had. I think it's. I think that those comments really do speak to the intention of the executive order, and I don't see how they won't be using that in court um, to try to shoot it down. Um, and I think it's a really strong argument. So I think the, the White House is probably wishing that that was not something that, you know, that they could use, that that's not evidence that it's, it's admissible. Uh, finally, Sabrina, let me ask you, the House Budget Committee narrowly voted Thursday to advance the Republican health care bill with defections from three Republicans on the committee and four Republican governors wrote congressional leaders saying this measure would not work in their states. Despite that, Speaker Paul Ryan struck an optimistic tone. Let's take a listen. Let me describe to you in one word what all this is about and what is happening legislating. This is legislating. This is going through the regular order process. Here in the House, we're going through four committees. We constantly get feedback. We constantly get, get suggestions from members, and we're working at bridging those gaps to get to make improvements in the bill so that members, uh, so we have a, a bill that can pass. And we feel like we're making great strides and great progress on getting a bill that can pass because it incorporates the kinds of feedbacks from members from all walks of life in our conference. So, Speaker Ryan, all but acknowledged this week that the bill will have to change to pass the House. What is at stake for him, Sabrina, at this point? Well, this is one of the most significant tests thus far of Paul Ryan's speakership in the House, as well as of Donald Trump's own negotiating power when it comes to members of his own party on Capitol Hill. As you note, the House Budget Committee only narrowly approved the Republican health care plan with three defections from Republicans, all of who are members of the conservative House Freedom Caucus. We know that conservative groups such as Club for Growth, the Koch, Fund, the Koch backed Americans for Prosperity and others are trying to lobby members against this bill because they believe it is not a sufficient replacement for Obamacare. And when you take that along with with the resistance you're getting from moderate Republicans who are worried about gutting the Medicaid expansion and the tens of millions of constituents who have gained access through Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, it's hard to see how Paul Ryan gets the 218 votes that he needs for this to pass on the House floor, where they're expected to vote, uh, they hope, by the end of the month. And then, of course, the Senate is already saying there's going to have to be changes here in their chamber to overcome a Democratic filibuster, as well as to get support from Republicans or a significant majority of Republicans. So I think this is only really the beginning, uh, but it really is a test to see what kind of negotiating power Paul Ryan has, as well as how, how to what extent he really is, as he says, working hand in glove with Donald Trump on this legislation. All right, Tara Palmieri and Sabrina Siddiqui in Washington. Thank you, ladies, both. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. your insights.